Hello and welcome to episode 157 of the How to Survive podcast. My name is Joe. Joining me as ever is Chris Morris. Hello, Chris. Our impulses are being redirected. Absolutely. This week, uh, I wanted to open with a, an old Spanish proverb. Yeah. He venido aquí para petir el culo y masticar chicle. And do you know what that means? Do tell. I have come here to kick ass and chew bubblegum. <laughs> now, ah. is this the film where that, from which that quote originates? Yes. It's also right. in Duke Nukem, is where I thought it was from. Mm, yeah. It's time to kick ass and chew bubblegum. And I am all out of gum. I've come here to kick ass and chew bubblegum. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Mm. Doesn't make any sense, but is funny. <laughs> <laughs> much like the How to Survive podcast. Uh, much like this week's film. They Live is the movie from 1988, starring Rowdy Roddy Piper uh, as <laughs> Nada. John Nada. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. He's a drifter oh. who has nothing. Nada. Yeah. Brilliant. He finds some glasses. We'll find out what happens after that later on. We're going to talk about They Live how uh, we found it, mm -hmm. how it is. Yeah. Tell you the things you didn't know from our wider research into the film mm -hmm. um, and talk about the legacy of the movie, which is extensive. Uh, then, of course, we will talk about how we would survive if we were unfortunate enough to found ourselves in 1988 Los Angeles with a pair of sunglasses mm. and... A bad attitude. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, the, if you haven't heard the How to Survive podcast before... It is absolutely full of spoilers. Mm. So if you've been keeping They Live <laughs> to one <laughs> For side. a rainy day. Yeah. Um, maybe duck out now and watch it. Maybe now is the rainy day during mm. this heat wave. Yeah. Otherwise, strap in. You're in for a bumpy ride, as we'll be picking up after this. things want and why are they here you still don't get it do you boy? they have recruited the rich and the powerful they're running the whole show wake up they're all about you all around you blind on us to the truth take a look they are safe as long as they are not discovered i don't know what they are or where they came from but we gotta stop them stay away from me put these on they have us look at them they're everywhere <laughs> We have no other choice. I don't like this one bit. Leave it alone, man. It ain't none of my business. Ain't none of yours. We have been lulled into a trance. Listen to what I'm saying to you. We're in trouble. The whole world's in trouble. Control us! You're sending some kind of signals on TV sets. I've got one that can see. Mama don't like tattletale. Now we start spilling some blood. Let's go! Push button. <laughs> So, Chris, a quick plot recap for anyone who hasn't seen They Live in a while. Mm -hmm. Nada is a homeless wanderer making his way around Los Angeles, working as a labourer to make ends meet. Nada meets Frank, another labourer who takes him to a shanty town, which the city's poorest residents have made their home. Around the camp, Nada notices that television sets have been set up and that broadcasts keep being intercepted by footage of a strange man talking about how some, some kinds of signals are being used to keep the populace in a state of waking sleep, blind to the reality around them. Quickly, Nada finds that the intercept message is being broadcast from a church opposite the camp. Shortly, the church is raided by SWAT teams, who also bulldoze the shantytown, killing and wounding many of the residents, in particular the organisers of the shantytown and the administrators of the church. The administrators? Yep. Administrative staff? Yes. Always bearing the brunt. <laughs> the next day, Nada enters the church to explore its burned-out remains and finds a box of sunglasses. Putting a pair on, he realises that the sunglasses give the wearer the ability to see the world for what it truly is. And what it is, is a dystopia which is run by terrible aliens and where all adverts, TV broadcasts, movies and printed media are actually hidden commands to obey, consume, reproduce and overall stay asleep and oblivious to the fact that humanity is enslaved by a small number of aliens. About right? Sounds about right so far. The aliens look identical to humans, but the glass has revealed them to be ghoulish humanoids with bug eyes. Uh, it's the best way to describe them, I think. Mm. Nada wastes no time and begins attacking aliens, killing two policemen, who are actually aliens, and using their guns to enter a bank and kill all the aliens inside. 
um, because, of course, the aliens also run the financial system. Yes. That's where the famous bubblegum line is delivered. Yeah. About 20 minutes into the film. You think it'd be a climax at the moment. But yeah. No, it just isn't. Yeah. It just happens. It happens. Suddenly you're there. Suddenly you're really there. It's <laughs> cinema history. One alien escapes by using his wristwatch to send a distress signal to other aliens before vanishing into thin air. Mm. Nada escapes, taking a human woman hostage. The woman is Holly, a network executive at Cable 54. He forces her to drive him to her home, and there he tries to explain what's happening, but predictably sounds like a lunatic. Mm. He tries to convince her to try on the sunglasses, but she responds by breaking a bottle over his head and pushing him through the window, yeah. which is closed. Mm. With the city now on high alert, treating Nada as a dangerous criminal who should be killed on sight, he is forced to move stealthily. And as such, he heads back to his last known place of work and seeks the company of his only known associate, Frank. Mm. He convinces Frank to meet him that evening. Frank tells Nada he wants nothing to do with him and gives him his pay for the week as a parting gift. Nada tries to convince Frank to try on the glasses to see the world for what it really is, first with the power of suggestion and then by violently beating him into unconsciousness for about 25 minutes. Yeah, it's about a, about seven or eight minute fight scene, I think. It's extensive. It's most of the film, I think. Yeah. Frank eventually agrees to try on the shades and is appalled by what he sees. Mm. The pair, now on the same team, take up residence in a hotel and begin drawing up their plans. And they're soon found by another member of the human resistance. At a meeting that evening, plans are drawn to attack the central signal antenna, which is on top of the Cable 54 building. Holly shows up. And remember, she's the executive at that same building. Yes. And she reveals that she tried on the sunglasses, ones that Nada dropped in her home, and she agrees to help. The meeting is raided by police and most of the resistance are killed. Frank and Nada escape by using an alien's wristwatch to jump through a portal into the alien's command center, which is in the basement of Cable 54. Mm. If it's sounding confusing, strap in. Uh, because once they get there, the two gate crash a black tie dinner where the world's human elite are being given a great deal by the alien overlords. Uh, one human assumes that Nada and Frank are also cooperating, gives them a tour of the facility, mm -hmm. showing them transgalactic transporters. <laughs> and revealing that the aliens go from planet to planet, keeping its inhabitants docile while they use up the planet's resources. Nada and Frank give him the slip and head into the Cable 54 building, killing aliens and sparing humans all the way to the top floor, where they find Holly, who has been taken hostage. Mm. They free her and make their way to the roof, but Holly double-crosses them, shooting Frank. Who would have thought that a woman who unprovoked threw a man out of a window after smashing a bottle around his, around his head would have turned out to be on the bad side. Nada returns the favour, killing her, and then blows up the signal transmitter, mm. killing himself. Yeah. Uh, luckily, the plan works and humanity is freed from its alien overlords. Mm. But at what cost? The cost of Rowdy Ruddy Piper. <laughs> Considerable cost. What did you think? When you sat down to watch They Live. When I sat down to watch it, I didn't really know what to expect. I thought it was going to be an odd film. You knew uh, a bit about it, I take it, by reputation. Yeah, but like very fleeting things, really. Mm. Like I knew the concept and I I had a fair guess at the tone yeah. and, and things like that. Um, I thought it would... I, I did enjoy it. I thought it would wear thin because of its very overt B-movie tongue-in-cheek tone. Yeah. Um, but it's just interesting and entertaining enough to sort of carry it through. It reminded me of Mars Attacks, but I didn't like Mars Attacks as much as I enjoyed uh, They Live. Mm. Um, I did. I loved Mars Attacks. Yes, yeah. Uh, but it is similar, I think, in the, especially the design of the aliens seems to have yeah. some similarity uh, and also the sort of overtly b-movie uh america and there's, there's like a sort of americana type yeah. tone to it as well like this could only happen in america that kind of feeling yeah um i think as i said before johnny john nada being a drifter who has nothing uh you know like an anonymous person with nothing john nada uh mm. that sort of detail is pretty indicative of the film's style i yeah. think yeah um and the whole thing has its its tongue mm firmly in its cheek much like escape from new york last week uh but I, it has some like 
pretty acerbic political views that um, I thought felt quite relevant today. And I looked up the 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 passage that the man on the television keeps reading. Okay. He's trying to wake people up from their slumber. Yeah. <laughs> Waking right? sleep, yeah. And it's this, right? Our impulses are being redirected. We are living in an artificially induced state of consciousness that resembles sleep. The poor and the underclass are growing. Racial justice and human rights are non-existent. They have created a repressive society and we are their unwitting accomplices. Their intention to rule rests with the annihilation of consciousness. We have been lulled into a trance. They have made us indifferent to ourselves, to others. We are focused only on our own gain. Please understand understand they are safe as long as they are not discovered that is their primary method of survival keep us asleep keep us selfish keep us sedated now does that or does that not feel like it's ripped out of an adam curtis documentary pretty much yeah adam, like, adam curtis for anyone who isn't familiar is a british documentary maker who make he makes these sort of like dreamy yeah uh like very hypnotic yeah, documentaries from sort of stock footage and yeah. philosophical. If you have, if you haven't seen any Adam Curtis, Google um, Adam Curtis Odearism on on YouTube or something. Uh, it's a it's a short film he made for Charlie Brooker's show, and it is very difficult. It's a good intro to his work, mm. uh, but then strap in for the rest of it because it is pretty. It's uh, quite intense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that that's what it reminded me of. It's it's got that same like you could write that paragraph about today's political climate absolutely i think there's that that's not an accident no. um you know we you mentioned it's a b movie um one of the questions i was going to ask you is do you think that it's b movie aesthetic dampens the brains in its concept um and I'll, I'll answer that in a minute because i want to give you a bit of background on the brains of it which mm. is what i think though anyway i think we talked about carpenter last week and when we did they and we did the thing a few years ago now. Yeah. Um, he is clearly a very politically driven director. Mm -hmm. And his movies, despite being being movies and somewhat schlocky in places, yeah. have a very deep undertone in them and a, a subtext which is quite easy to pick out. And it um, generally isn't, generally is quite hard to miss, I think. Yeah. If you're looking for it. Uh, he wears it on his on his sleeve. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, he takes inspiration from the likes of I think Karl Marx in this movie, Chomsky, and Aldous Huxley, mm -hmm. whose writings all in various ways focus on media manipulation, class struggles, and the need to become aware of what's really happening around us. Mm. I don't think it's quite Orwellian, as it's not really about totalitarianism uh, or surveillance, as much as like last week's movie, it's right. New York was. Yeah, it's more about sedating the masses, um, and mm. in that way, it's more Huxley. So if you think of a brave new world. Uh, have you read that? Yeah, I have. Yeah, so that's that's more about maintaining a hierarchical system uh, to sedate people by providing pleasure. Mm. Uh, so that book talks about people in the upper class who do weird things like sports and orgies at the expense of the lower classes, essentially. Mm -hmm. And the government conditions them through playing mantras in their sleep and things like that. Um, it teaches them to like their own class and dislike others. Mm. Uh, it teaches them to obey and to engage in all the fun activities and teaches them to dislike nature and the real world mm. uh, because there's no profit in it which is essentially the plot of they live yeah uh i think there are lines in it which give away what seem to be his well-read approach so you know, obviously that that passage you just read out but also as a throwaway line someone says something like this happens every hundred years or so mm. now that that fits with marx i think uh who said that capitalism goes in cycles before it hits a crisis and collapses again and also, Kondratiev, who was a Russian economist, said mm -hmm. similar things. His was more based on invention and how every 50 years we'll invent something new and there'll be a new cycle of industry. Right. But both writers are essentially saying capitalism is flawed yeah. and will collapse and the rich are going to be rich and the poor are going to be poor and there's going to be exploitation. Mm. And that is clearly Carpenter's message here, I think. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely about... Um the way in which uh, a political class or an elite class keep the masses sedated by giving them, you know, pretty pictures, to yeah, look at. material yeah. goods and, and entertainment. So that being said, I mean that's that's quite a, a deep dive into the politics of the film. Yeah, and I think we can probably leave it there because 
that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Because the movie is, other than that, quite a dumb action movie. Yeah. Do you, uh, to uh, bring back to that question I was about to ask you, do you think that the dumb action movie, B-movie, takes away from that political message which is in its DNA? Well, I think... Um, I'm not sure the film has any aspirations to be any anything more than a, a B-movie with that sort of shallow um, or, you know, thin thinly sketched out uh political idea mm. uh, i think i think that's basically it like there is the germ of an idea that you know a cabal of aliens are enslaving humanity through capitalism but the framing of this idea is so completely b-movie you know glasses that see through the <laughs> illusion <laughs> right sunglasses yeah well. yeah exactly yeah. uh the, the every every facet every facet of the film is geared towards it being a you know drive-in movie a b-movie or yeah, whatever right. um there could be a sort of manchurian candidate-esque you know real intense political thriller uh somewhere in there but i just don't think john carpenter has any interest in making that film no he wants to make like, he he's torn i think with with many of his movies he seems to live in a, a nether world between wanting to make a special effects horror movie Mm. and wanted to make a political thriller yeah it's like he wants to um wake everyone up to what he perceives are the sort of evils and imbalances in the world but also he wants to make a film where there's you know a a head can grow legs and crawl off of someone's (laughs) body (laughs) exactly but i think you know any way you read it he certainly is anti-capitalist yeah and it reminded me of Dawn of the Dead politically as well. Yeah, I think yeah. that's that's very similar. It's in as much, in, in in similar ways they are that lives between being a zombie movie and being a. I mean, you can, you can read the message of Dawn of the Dead at like GCSE level, mm. maybe younger than that. Yeah, um, media studies It's pretty thick. Um, yeah, but then also you can just enjoy it as a zombie. movie. Exactly it. Exactly it. Yeah, I think it, perhaps it loses out on the fact that they chose Rowdy Roddy Piper to be the lead in the movie. Right, and that one of the two things everyone remembers from the film is the line. I've come here to kick ass and chew bubblegum. Yeah. The other legacy is Obey, um, a slogan which was appropriated by the street artist Shepard Ferry. Mm. Uh, do you know him? I, I know the Obey logo. Yeah. yeah. So he, he also is known for the Obama Hope poster. Okay. Um, that design. You, you know that, I'm sure. Uh, and you also know his Andre the Giant stencil as well. Uh, sure. Which is part of the Obey brand. Um, it's from a, a campaign, a street art campaign called Laundry the Giant Has a Posse. Um, okay. <laughs> where he got sued on the back of that by Titan Sports for using the name Andre the Giant. So then he used Obey, which was out of copyright, mm. on, on his clothing brand to align it with the anti-authoritarian movie They Live. Mm. Um, his, his idea was basically that street art was too on the nose and that phrases like fuck Bush, which is what street art would have been in in time, were a bit too obvious. Yeah. So he went for something more subtle, which was obey. Mm. And that's obviously like a anti-obey uh, yeah. thing. And I, I encourage you, if you haven't looked into him, just to Google Shepherd Fairy lawsuit. Because okay. he's been sued lots of times and they're just <laughs> insane, every single one of them. Right. Um, my favorite one is when he was sued by the Associated Press for using their photo of Obama for his stencil on the Hope poster. Mm. And he then sued them for defamation because he hadn't used their picture but then he realized he was mistaken and they were right so then he destroyed the proof <laughs> and then he got charged with a contempt of court yeah i was gonna say if you've heard that he's destroyed the proof and yeah. it obviously didn't work <laughs> um now he's he's what's called an appropriative artist he takes ideas and makes them his own mm. appropriation has also beguiled this film in other ways okay we talked about the matrix a few years weeks ago i'm sure you remember Mm-hmm. good episode that was and we said at the time you know the matrix the idea of waking up to something uh and mm-hmm. waking up to the real world around you is something that this movie shares with the matrix and in the matrix you take a red pill and you wake up and see the world for what it is yeah and that's been appropriated by incels and the, the alt-right yeah who the say that, mras yeah. exactly taking a red pill wakes you up to the reality that is um, a world where women are forcing men into a marginalized existence. Yeah. Which is nuts. Mm. But so too, they live has been misappropriated um, by neo-Nazis in this case. Mm-hmm. So basically, 
since about 2008, uh, various neo-Nazis online have said that the movie is about uh, a cabal of Jewish elitist media. Type. But you're familiar mm. with the, the trope of the, yeah, the a, Jewish, a Jewish run yeah, media. Yeah, yeah. Who, yes. like, now, this the, the neo-Nazi supposition is that this movie is about that uh, conspiracy theorist right. and saying that all the aliens are therefore the Jewish people, mm. which John Carpenter tweeted um, in response to this saying, they live is about yuppies and unrestrained capitalism. It has nothing to do with Jewish control of the world, which is a slander and a lie. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. He says uh, in another interview, he said, they live was giving the finger to Reagan when nobody else would. And by the end of the 70s, there was a backlash against everything in the 60s. And that's what the 80s were. And Reagan became president and Reaganomics came in. So a lot of the ideals that I grew up with, that's John mm. Carpenter, not me, were under assault. And something called a yuppie came into existence. Mm -hmm. And they just wanted to make money. And so by the late 80s, I'd had enough. And I decided I had to make a statement. And as stupid and as banal as it is, I made one. And that's They Live. Yeah, he... Um much like we said with the matrix where it's almost ironic that you know a film that has been championed by mras was made by two trans women yeah uh they live was you know it seems sort of railing against all of the uh things that i'd imagine neo nazis hold dear yeah exactly in, yeah. in terms of like conservative american politics and yeah. uh capitalism and yeah it's just bizarre how that can fly over their heads yeah. it's, it's strange it's weird we often say you know we had often say but we have said in the past that a, a filmmaker doesn't necessarily hold the rights on what their movie's about mm. you can interpret it however you want and um, and it could be a meaning they didn't even intend to put in it. Yeah. And I think with Alien or The Shining, there's there's lots of ways to interpret them. I would say this is unequivocal. Yeah, because and, and it's it's unequivocal because it's so shallow. Yeah, like and it's they, not like it's, the Matrix it's said in the film. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not like the Matrix where there are you know there's a, a lot of spectacle and a lot of um, quite dense plot. Yeah, uh, under you know underpinned with various social and political messages. Yeah. This is just, you know, pretty blatant, isn't yeah. it? There's a reason they got, like, um, Lawrence Fishburne to deliver a lot of the exposition. It's because he's got, like, a good voice for, like, delivering complicated things because he's, you know, calm and measured and he's got yeah. deep... They got Rowdy Roddy Piper in this film who just shouts a lot. Yeah. And punches He people. is a wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad it wasn't lost on you, the fact that he's a wrestler. Yeah, well, he's... I mean, you sort of alluded to the fact that he maybe wasn't a very good uh, action hero. But I think, actually, um, the wrestler personality type is perfectly suited for an action hero because it's all about uh, being a work working-class all-American hero mm. who wisecracks and fights. Yeah. And that's basically all you have to do. Well, I've got a bit of a... I've put together my own history of action heroes and let's see how far okay. you agree with this. So I think in the 20s to the 60s, and I'm being very broad here, this is kind of back of the napkin maths. Yeah. You've got Douglas Fairbanks types who were basically trained dancers and mm. they transferred that physique into sword fighting. Right. So you get things like pirates or the fourth or fifth yeah. musketeer. Right, exactly. Or yeah. Robin Hood and or his merry men. Um, the 40s to the 70s, you'd have lone gunmen who shoot first and ask questions later mm -hmm. and then later just shoot and then quip. Mm -hmm. Um Lots of war hero movies. Um, and then you've got the likes of John Wayne and James Bond coming out from that sort of style. And then in the 70s and 80s, you've got the kind of revisionist action where right. war becomes hell. So Clint Eastwood becomes the hero. Yeah. But rather than relishing being in the fight, he just is intensely annoyed by everything. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, the disaster movies at that point became an enterprise. So you've got action heroes, which is somewhere between Douglas Fairbanks's tap dancer body and gearing towards the muscle men of the 80s. Mm. But you end up with somewhere in between, which is like Gene Hackman, Paul Newman, Steve McQueen. Yeah, Steve McQueen, but when he was in his, like, 50s. Yeah, exactly. So he got what I would describe as barrel-chested PE teachers. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dad bods. <laughs> yeah, dad bods, exactly, yeah. And then you've got the 80s, which is Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> Sylvester Stallone, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Dolph Lundgren, uh, Chuck Norris, and Bruce Willis. Yes. Now, I think... And I haven't read this anywhere. I can only assume Chuck Norris would have been the first choice for this film, for They Live. Do you think? He is pretty, like... But he's 
like conservative American poster boy. Isn't exactly. It? Yeah. So yeah. maybe not. Um, but all those people, and I dare say Roddy Piper too, are essentially meathead bodybuilders who don't have much to say, but they're muscular and they look like their bodies could feasibly deflect close range missile attacks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, then the eighties, we also got our first female action heroes: Ripley, Sarah Connor. Nineties, mm -hmm. a lot of focus on stunts, uh, which gives a more lightweight heroes a bit of a chance. So Will Smith and Mel Gibson, yeah, look good, getting nearly blown up, uh, but speeding away from things and cars. Keanu, Keanu, and Tom Cruise came out of that era, mm. um, and from there, stunt-led movies, you get the likes of Vin Diesel, the Triple X, mm. Fast and the Furious. It goes without saying that martial arts has been with Hollywood since Bruce Lee came into the mainstream. Yeah. But it was mainly the favoured style of oriental villains for a lot of the time. Mm. Uh, or Jackie Chan. That would eventually get defeated by like a, a stiff yeah. punch. It, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a comedy sidekick staple, basically. Right, the 90s. yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the Matrix made it very serious. So everyone had to be amazing at martial arts in action movies. So you, then you get the things like the Bourne Identity, which were gritty spy thrillers where yep. violence mattered. If you hit someone in the head, they get hurt. Mm. And so action heroes had to be cold and calculating as well as fit. So Matt Damon, Daniel Craig, those types. Tom Cruise again, I'd say, mm -hmm. in newer Mission Impossibles. And I think more recently there's become a need for a renaissance action hero, which is someone who's athletic, knows how to fight, is incredibly intelligent, has amazing comedic timing, looks amazing, and is very likable. You want to be his best friend. Well, the, what they've done is get um, American sitcom actors, yep, yep. give them like, you know, 120 kilos of turkey breast. Yeah. And then just made them insanely ripped and given them a gun. Yeah. So you get Marvel Universe. Yeah. Chris Pratt. Yeah. And then I, some more Tom Cruise in there as well. Yeah. I mean, fair play to him. He's still going. He's 56. Yeah. 56. Maybe. Three years younger than when. Um, Whatever his name was when he started One Foot in the Grave. Richard Wilson. Richard Wilson. Three years younger than w Richard Wilson when he started One Foot in the Grave. So uh, Richard Three Wilson. Three years younger than Victor Meldrew <laughs> yeah. and he's doing high altitude, low opening parachute jumps. 106. Let's not forget. 106. 106 of, of the jumps. Yeah. 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 Yes. Victor Meldrew. I do not remember Victor Meldrew doing any halo jumps. No. Have you seen Mission Impossible Fallout? Not yet. It is a 10 out of 10 romp. Is it a good action film? <laughs> I, I would give it my romp stamp of approval. What did you think of my history of action? Yeah, I, th I think you're about right. Yeah, so you put... I mean, Roddy Piper's basically he's, the tail end of the... Um, the 80s, I think. Mm, he's, yeah. yeah, he's in with the Lundgrens. Yeah, but sort of when they were going out of fashion. I think so. Uh, you got any examples of bad action heroes? Yeah, I think um, they tend to come from sort of good actors thinking that they can just make a sideways move, yeah. but actually finding that it's a lot more difficult than they thought. Um, I think Ben Affleck yeah, as Daredevil and pretty, in uh, uh, Paycheck <laughs> yeah. and um, more recently in the, uh, the DC universe. Um, mm. he's, oh, Batman. Yeah. I think Batman's a bit of a curse for anyone except Christian Bale. Right. Like but, Val Kilmer didn't do him any favours, didn't do George Clooney any favours. But, okay, can I um, uh, raise you with Halle Berry? Yeah. <laughs> I think the, the movie was a mess before she arrived at it. Yeah, um, probably. It wasn't her doing. No, but... But she isn't an action hero. She, basically, you need, you need um, charisma and a physical presence. Yeah. Like presence, basically, is, is a good way of describing yeah. what you need. Is it Clive Owen? Yeah, he's not good, is he? No. Uh, yeah, just any any sort of contemporary drama actor who thinks that they can just make a sort of easy sidestep into yeah. it. I think that's why I've never really liked Liam Neeson as an action hero. Well, I was going to say there's a slew... Because I think he he's good in Taken. I'm not sure I've even seen Taken 2 or Taken 3. Or 4. Taken the 4th? Have you just made that up? I don't know, there might be a 4th. Attention listeners, there is no taken four and no plans to make one. He's quite good in Taken because it's he's taking it so seriously. Yeah, yeah. Like but that that that's what makes it amusing and entertaining because yeah. he's, you know, doing the whole I will find you. <laughs> exactly. Uh, like, <laughs> but then since then there's been a sort of slew of um, you know, aged 
uh, actors going, oh yeah, I could do, I could yeah. do a bit of that, bit taken. Uh, not least um, earlier this year, uh, I think I sent you the poster to this, um, mm. Michael Flatley released an action movie. <laughs> The Lord of the Dance. The Lord of the Dance. The very same. Yeah. Not an actor. Was it? <laughs> What's it called? Well, it's called Blackbird. Mm. Um, and it is uh, written, directed and starring Michael Flatley. An auteur work. Yes. I'm sure it's all terrible. <laughs> so, you know, we, we occasionally do a quiz on, this, on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Last week we had a quiz on a movie about escaping from prison. Yes. This week, I want to do something a little bit different. Okay. Right? I want to put you in the film. So they live, famously, a man finds a pair of sunglasses that let him see the world for what it really is. Yeah. The people who are in disguise around him, he can suddenly see who they really are beneath that disguise. Okay. Is that about right? Yeah. So with that in mind, you've found some sunglasses. Uh-huh. And you're walking down the street, and up ahead is a group of people that you've seen many times before. Right? Now, you're going to get a chance to approach each person. Okay. I'll describe their disguise to you. And then you put on your sunglasses. You tell me who it is. Okay. Right? But I'm going to sweeten the deal by allowing you to ask them one question. Okay. And that will be, um, they'll answer that. Is it a specific in question? Character. Any question you like. It may be incomprehensible. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you the, the, the boiled down version okay. is this. Yeah. I'm going to describe a character from a movie. Yeah. You get a chance to ask a question to which the response is a line from the movie. Right. And you say who played them. Okay, fine. Makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, I've got it. Let's do a quick run through of that. Mm -hmm. um, a homeless man who has been making his way around Los Angeles has some nice new sunglasses and seems sceptical. Okay. Why, why are you here? I have come here to kick ass and chew bubblegum. Are you John Nada? Yes, but who played me? Oh, Rowdy Roddy Piper? Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. So you, you, you with the quiz now? Yeah, so it's the actor, not the character. Both, if you want. Right, okay, but fine. But the only points are for telling me who is okay. in disguise. All right. But, <laughs> okay, right. This has been months in the, uh, yeah. in the planning. Yeah. Question one. Yeah. This heavily tattooed man has great sea legs. Um, <laughs> how are you today? <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, is it Dwayne the Rock Johnson uh, as um, Maori? Yeah, in Moana. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did I tell you that one? Didn't I? No, you didn't. I, I worked it out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well done. It only took me about five minutes of concentrated <laughs> thinking. One out of one. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thanks. Question two. This police officer is hot on the trail of a masked maniac who seems to love horror films. Uh, I don't know what question to ask. That's part of the fun. Um, how's it going? Well, a serial killer is not really accurate. Got to knock off a couple more to get that title. Uh, is it Dewey Finn? Dewey Finn's from School of Rock. What's it? Dewey, what's Dewey, Dewey is right. Dewey. Officer Dewey. Dewey. Right, yeah. Officer yeah. Dewey. Okay. Yeah. Yes. From, uh, I don't know who played him. From, what, from Scream. You, right. Uh, it was played by David Arquette. Okay, that's right. Yes. Question three. Mm -hmm. This man has kidnapped a young girl called Buttercup. He is very tall. Why did you kidnap Buttercup? We face each other as God intended. Sportsman-like. No tricks, no weapons. Skill against skill alone. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. It's, of course... Fezzik from Princess Bride. <laughs> right. I thought it might be Princess Bride. I've never seen it. And neither have I. Great. Andre the Giant is the man. I see. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look. Look who's up next. <laughs> it's, this man is a prisoner in a game of American football where guards play prisoners. He is bald. Um, so is that... Um, <laughs> What what are you in prison for? Wow, no bullshit. Football against the guards? Well, is uh, is it Chris Rock? No, what's his name? Is it Chris Rock? No, it was <laughs> Bill Goldberg <laughs> as Joey Battle. What? Question five. <laughs> Do you know what the film is that I'm thinking of? Yeah. What? Longest shot. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. 
So it was that film. It's a quick film. Right, okay, fine. There's like 11 people on each team. Great. So why not pick the most obscure one? <laughs> this man is a guard in a game of American football where guards play prisoners. He, oh, a he guard. is bored. Right, fine. Well, the, yeah. that, the first one was a prisoner. Oh, right. This one is a guard. This is, a this new is another question. question. Right. It's a new question. Okay. Chris. A new question. <laughs> Who was on the other team? <laughs> um, is it. Oh, sorry. Uh, what do you think of the prisoners? <laughs> That's how a white man runs the football. <laughs> uh, is it Gene Hackman? <laughs> it's Stone Cold Steve Austin who played Guard Dunham. Right. Oh, man. Question six. You're not doing too well with this. Have we got one out of, one out of five? I've got the link now. This man's <laughs> family were killed by an invasionary force. He takes things literally, but if he stands still for too long, he might just vanish. Uh, <laughs> Why well, is Dave Bautista? Yep. As um, Drax. Drax the Destroyer. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and the link was... Uh, there's one more. There's oh, one sorry. more question. <laughs> yeah. This former wrestler has become a bodyguard and nanny <laughs> to some children, but they've been kidnapped and held to ransom for a computer chip. Um, I don't know. Uh, hello. <laughs> if you're getting ready for a fight, you just need attitude, not muscles. Yeah, I've got no chance. I don't know. John Cena, is it? No, it's Hulk Hogan. <laughs> right. In Mr. Nanny. Oh, uh, how could I. A movie forget? rated 7% on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> I have seen it. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I'll spare you the last one. It was John Cena. He was Ferdinand. Oh, the bull? Yeah. Right. I wouldn't have got that. What's the link between all of them, Chris? <laughs> uh, they are all wrestlers. You're correct, yeah. They, in fact, they're all WWE champions. Or WCW. Uh, can you get the, the link which I think just leaves Batista out? Um, no. They're all Hall of Famers. Okay. Even David Arquette. Attention listeners. They are not all Hall of Famers. David Arquette, The Rock, and Batista have not been inducted into the Hall of Fame. WCW champion, David Arquette. There's a reason WCW went bust, Chris, and it's because David Arquette was champion. <laughs> you, when's your wrestling podcast? This is it. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was painful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I apologise. I apologise. Maybe next week I'll just stick to the usual format. <laughs> I think. I think the the trouble was the the quote thing was really so good. inane. <laughs> it's just like you could have just gone like, "Oh, he's walking around. He's really tall." He comes up to you and says <laughs> that rather than going <laughs> ask him a question. <laughs> Any question, the answer <laughs> might not make sense. Because <laughs> it's like, I was so confused. I thought you'd be like playing the character and you'd like improv some, no, some no, responses. No. Just, <laughs> no, no, no. I've got one line I've yeah. found on IMDb. I haven't seen the movie half the time. What am I going to do? That's why you get the line. It's not my fault. Wow. No bullshit. Football against the guards. Now, what I want to know, Chris, is if you were unfortunate enough to find mm. yourself in 1988 LA yeah. and you found yourself some glasses mm. and you were able to easily distinguish wrestlers from actors, mm -hmm. how would you survive the events of They Live? Right. So um, much like the... Much like last week's film... And my idea for surviving that was to basically um, abandon your political beliefs because you, it's for the greater good. Uh, you could do the mm. same thing here, but for for personal good uh, and greater good, in the sense that if you just keep, if you find out that aliens are on the world, yeah. right, and they're embedded into every organisation and you know, uh, and so on, yeah, just keep your head down, right? Don't get involved, okay? Because why? Let me tell you. Because if society is based on the, you know, the rule of the aliens, yeah, 
it will collapse completely once they're gone. If it, it would be complete anarchy, which I think to some extent is what John Carpenter is, you know, John Carpenter finds that appealing. Yeah. Which is why these films have those. Like, <laughs> he's an anarchist. Yeah. yeah. Um, just imagine if everything underpinning democracy and, you know, life as we know it disappeared, mm. the world would sink into utter chaos, wouldn't it? And it would be very bad. Maybe, but at the same time, do you want to be live in a world where you're being used as a commodity and mined as a resource? Well, you're not personally being mined as a resource. You're, you are, though. Well, no, because they're, they're using up the planet's resources. They're not, like, right. grinding humans up into paste or whatever. So you could you could live a comfortable life, as you see the uh, the global elite doing. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I think... It's borderline irresponsible to expose the aliens in some ways because mm. you're 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 consigning the world to sink into chaos. When you see the people who are involved in the in the shadowy cabal, yeah. it's law enforcement, it's banks, it's the media. Uh, I presume it's politicians as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Imagine if those pillars of society collapse. So everyone loses their money because the banks are, are collapsing. Yeah. Uh, there's no rule of law being enforced and there's no democracy because politicians cease to exist, right? Even if it's even if it's false democracy, right? Yeah. It's it's a way of keeping society sedate and preventing anarchy and violence in mm-hmm, the street. Mm-hmm. So without that society would collapse and, and thousands of people would die. But anarchy doesn't necessarily mean violence. No, it doesn't. But I don't believe that people wouldn't allow a power vacuum to, you know, exist without someone using it to their advantage. Could the, could the message perhaps be that people who are asleep, so to speak, um, won't always rush to fill that vacuum? Yeah, but the, the the thing is though, right? That for example, in the Matrix, yeah, if you freed everyone all of a sudden, right, from the Matrix, yeah, millions and millions and millions of them would die because there's just not the resources. Society isn't set up to cope with that sudden influx of, you know, ninety five percent of the population or whatever. Yeah, right. And in a similar way. For better or worse, the entire um, of modern society in this film has um, wound up having their every whim catered for and their life governed by shadowy aliens. So you take those aliens away, so suddenly you've just got a bunch of incapable humans taking care of Not things. Not quite. I think it's more like if everyone in the Matrix was in the Matrix and whilst in the Matrix, rather than being woken up in the real world, they were just told you have a parasite and then they all lost their parasite. Maybe. I'm not sure. I, th- I think it's... I see your point. Yeah. I think you're saying like the society would crumble. Yeah, but maybe that's, that's what's needed because well, the society maybe, maybe, under right. this structure But, but is, I, th- I think good. in some way it speaks to an American ideal uh, that freedom is paramount, right? And even if it costs millions of lives, which is a theme that seems common to John Carpenter's work, yeah. considering the ending of Escape from New York last week, <laughs> yes. in which uh, a character consigns the world to nuclear war because he disagrees with the politician, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And I think it, I think it's a similar situation here. I think Rowdy Roddy Piper should have, you know, once he realised that the the extent to which these um, aliens had taken control, he should have really taken on a sort of uh, degree of responsibility for for what had happened to the world. I said, yeah, okay, but he's dead. He martyred himself. Yeah, but then he shouldn't have. He martyred himself. He knowingly martyred himself to expose the aliens. Yeah, and he's he's basically created an awful lot of mess and not stuck around to help deal with it. Here's a question: Would hmm. you rather? Um, let's say there was a, a, an alien living in your attic which t- skimmed a load of money off your bank account each week mm. and ate half your food and was just generally making your life more difficult and was yeah. invisible so you didn't know. Yeah. Would you rather know it was there? Well, it depends though because it's like if the alien was also, you know, powering my home and making sure my home had running water and, yeah. you know... I had the basics of of um, life to some extent taken care for taken care of. 
then maybe it would be worth thinking twice about about getting rid of it. Yeah. yeah, and also if I never knew, then it wouldn't it wouldn't bother me, would it? That's true. I mean, ignorance is bliss. Yeah, but that's also like ignorance. literally like saying politics doesn't affect me. It is. It's slightly different because it's slightly different because when people say our oh, politics doesn't affect me, it's usually in response to someone who is voting in their self interest, mm. right? As opposed to uh, what many people believe you should do with politics in that you should vote for the greater good, right? Mm. And I'm not convinced that the greater good is that everyone suddenly has to fend for themselves because aliens are exposed. I'm, I'm very much of the John Carpenter opinion that every single member of the media, police, banks and politics is an alien and needs to be killed. Yeah, no, I think I think that's that's basically what I was getting at. Yeah, yeah. you described the movie as um, David Icke the movie, right? <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah, like conspiracy theorist catnip the movie. Yes, correct. Have you got any ideas? Yeah, uh, this is for the guy who goes up to um, Nada right. and Frank, right? In the world elite meeting mm -hmm. and mistakes them for other members of the world elite. Yeah. Right. Now check their IDs. <laughs> well, I think before that they're, they're homeless men wearing working clothes. Mm. Like I think maybe Frank's wearing overalls. Yeah. They're, they're, they're not giving any indication that they're members of the global elite. No, what you're saying. no. Yeah. it's a black tie dinner and yeah. they're wearing polo shirts. Yeah. Denim. Yeah. Like, um, yes. And he's like, guys, Finally, some people like me. Mm. And they're like, yeah, people like me too. He, yeah. He's, yeah. Yeah. He, so, so basically your he, advice is to, is to take cues from their appearance yeah. to recognize an imposter. Maybe he's- If um, everyone's in a uniform and someone isn't wearing the uniform, then you would- yeah, see them as an outsider. That's that's why the, the black tie dinners and things exist. It's, it's it's a ceremony, isn't it? Yeah. And if someone, if I walked into a black tie dinner wearing what I'm wearing now, mm -hmm. a white tie, <laughs> yeah, I would be laughed at. Yes, you would be. You'd be um, laughed at the room. Yeah. Yes. And they'd say, "Are you an imposter?" Yeah, they'd say, "Hang on, you're not one of the global elite." <laughs> uh, Little do removed. they know. Yeah. 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 This media empire. Hang on, let me built. put these sunglasses on. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. How about you? Any more thoughts? Yeah. Uh, this is a sort of uh, financial tip. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Don't waste your money on newspapers uh, if yeah. every page oh, is, yeah. uh, <laughs> is a giant uh, <laughs> subliminal message that you can see because you are an alien. <laughs> uh, near the start of the film, we see just after Johnny uh, gets his glasses. Yeah, uh, he sees one of the first aliens he sees is um, one who goes and buys a newspaper, yeah. which, as we can see with the glasses on, just has the words like "obey," "buy," you know. Like, <laughs> I think sleep. my favorite one is "honor apathy." <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All those sort of messages on it, and yet the alien is there <laughs> reading the paper. <laughs> Like, quite contentedly. <laughs> like, shit, like, he's, he goes out to the stand, he picks up the paper, looks through the first few, you know, like, yeah, this is all in order. I'll pay, I'll pay good money for this, right? Like, he gets home, his wife's <laughs> like, why are you wasting your money on this shit? It's just to keep the little slave people, <laughs> like, in control. And you're just going out, wasting our money. That's our child's university funds. And you travel across the galaxy to go buy your pathetic little obey <laughs> paper. Don't, don't forget that the money is also... <laughs> the money is also yeah, yeah. I go miss it, like post your guard or whatever it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every <laughs> every shop, no matter what's in it, just has like consume. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, let's get down to the consume. What is the technology that allows this like double <laughs> printing of everything? It's fascinating. <laughs> How would you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need orange. Well, I've walked into the cobblers because <laughs> everything looks identical. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, I meant to buy orange juice, but I bought milk because there's no indication. They all just say obey on the side of it. When you pour it out, it's just black and white. <laughs> Drink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like the fact that the, the poster there's a poster of a woman who's like nudie yeah. and it says marry and reproduce yeah like, well, it must have been a woman in that originally or does she marry wait does it, does it does it turn into when it is printed onto the thing yeah does it has the message printed under it mm. it's kind of x-ray vision isn't it it's like yeah, this is what's really so. underneath it yeah uh, and also black and white vision. The sunglasses. That's oh, okay. What well, was famously turned everything <laughs> into black and white. Yeah. Black and white, mate. Yeah. Maybe the, the, the neo Nazis were right. The yeah. world is black and white. Great. Make sure uh, you cut that out and send it all around the internet, please. <laughs> any, any further thoughts? Yeah. This is for. What's her fucking name? Holly. Mm hmm. Um, she shoots Frank in the head at point blank range. Right. Doesn't she? Yes. It's much to the shock of nobody. Um, and then old Roddy Piper runs up the top and blows up the the thing. Mm-hmm. Why didn't she just shoot both of them? Yeah. Um, just shoot them, shoot them both. It's because she's so overcome with, with emotion after their meeting earlier. <laughs> <laughs> she's got very blue eyes. You find mm. that? Striking, yeah. striking woman. Uh, I don't know why she doesn't shoot um, John, but uh, I would suggest that it's plot reasons. Yeah. Um, but I agree that it's not the best excuse. Shoot him and then you're well away. Yeah. Oh, so does every logo say you can see <laughs> Well, no, they all have different things. So, you know, when they run out and they're looking at the police copter, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. At, when the, the church is being like surveilled by the, the police copter and the yeah the priest and the, the like the guy from the video run out and they're wearing their sunglasses and they're like looking up and shaking their fists at the chopper yeah and they're wearing the sunglasses what do you think they see are they looking for the like, i don't know the word obey printed on the side of it yeah or are they like, for it's interesting flying? that the church is not one of the the icons yeah yeah the pillars of society that is corrupted by the aliens yeah and it's it is the place from which the the truth is broadcasted yeah weird because Carpenter is famously an atheist, according to his Wikipedia page. <laughs> famously, according to his Wikipedia page. <laughs> Very famous man, John Carpenter. Yeah. That's that. Mm. So, with all that said, Chris, mm-hmm. that concludes John Carpenter season. Yeah. On How to Survive podcast. Yeah, it's been quite a ride. Yeah. There isn't really anywhere to go after they live because his career panned and... Now he's a composer again. Yeah, well, he made fourteen films in the in fifteen years from nineteen seventy four to uh, eighty eight. Sorry, thirteen films in fourteen years from nineteen eighty four to nineteen eighty eight, and he's only made seven films since. Yeah, all of which were either critical or commercial flops. I think. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, mm. Ghosts on Mars. Apparently that was going to be the concluding chapter of the Escape from trilogy. Really? Yeah, Escape from Mars. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Unfortunately, Escape from LA was a bomb. Anyway. The John Carpenter of Mars there. Very good. Um, interestingly, when I was doing my research, I came across Village of the Damned, which is what I thought Children of the Corn was before we watched that. Ah, I see. Right. That's why I was excited to watch it and was disappointed when we got not that. Well, hopefully next week you won't be disappointed with the film that we're covering, which is the Nicholas Rogue classic, uh, Don't Look Now, mm. which bears a strong comparison, I would say, to Hereditary. Okay. Um, a lot of similar themes. A lot of people have been making that comparison. I understand you've never seen it. I have not seen it. It will be an interesting one to talk about, I think. Don't uh, Look Now. Yes, Don't Look Now. Yeah, and that's followed the following week with the, the only logical pairing for a, a, a movie which is presumably about yeah, a sober, family-related a, horror. A sober portrayal of grief yeah. and trauma um, followed up with an American werewolf in London. Yeah. Uh, another classic horror that we hadn't covered. Yeah. Um, a lot of people say Don't Look Now is the scariest horror movie ever made. Well, True they, facts. they haven't seen an American werewolf in London. No, they haven't. We'll be well, going toe to toe over the next few weeks. Mm-hmm. What's the scariest film ever out of those two films? Is it Don't Look Now? We'll find out next week. If you'd like to get in touch and recommend a film, 
or if you've got any feedback or comment or comments of any kind, then the email address is how to survive show at gmail.com. Yeah, that's exactly what Kale and Kelly did. I do apologize. I, I often do this. I we seem to get emailed by people with car crashes for names. <laughs> Uh, oh, good apology, mate. <laughs> uh, how, would you, how would you read that name? Uh, I have a feeling it, m- it might be something like Kieran. Kieran? Maybe. With I don't know. L? I don't know. It's, it's, you know, Irish, Irish names are car crashes. <laughs> <laughs> listen, I'm sorry. Old, uh, listen, car crash Kelly's been in touch. <laughs> Okay. Apologies for not getting your name right, yeah. Kaylin. Yeah. Kaylin. But what I would say is, if you insist on having such a stupid name, <laughs> it's got an accent over the A, which is like yeah. R. Kaylin. Kaylin. Yeah, because the way to make it less offensive is to do it in a funny Irish <laughs> accent. What did he say? Uh, Mister or Mrs. Kelly says, <laughs> "Hey guys, not been listening long, and I'm currently going through the pod and watching along." Any chance of Not you- the Brundle pod, I hope. Because he'll end up it's mashed an- together with his uh, podcatcher of choice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. <So> that, <laughs> going back <laughs> through the pod, watching along. Any chance of you adding the original Black Christmas and Jack Frost to your list? You'll love one of those. And absolutely despise the other. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, well, that Russian it, roulette. Yeah, well, it's currently August. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we might not get around to it for a, a few months, but consider it placed on the list. Uh, it's a heat wave one. Yeah. <laughs> Literally <laughs> the hottest week of the year. And he's emailing in asking whether we're going to cover some Christmas films. Which we'll think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but thank you very much for the email. Uh, you can email in how to survive show at gmail.com or tweet at how to survive pod. And please do spell your name phonetically. <laughs> <laughs> please include an audio recording of how you say your name. Yeah, we did say that a while ago. If, you, if you've got thoughts on how you survive in any of the movies or you want to get in touch with a, a voice message, you can do that by just recording your voice and sending it to us in whatever format suits your phone. Yeah. We've got incredible technology on our side. You know, this this podcast rakes it in, so we, we've yeah. invested too much money in audio conversion software. Yeah, the listener audio conversion software machine that yeah. we had specially built is is currently gathering dust. So, so. whether you want to send an MP3, an M4, or <laughs> whatever it might be. Yeah. It's a, it's a ringtone file. <laughs> Blast from the past. Right. With thank- all that said, yeah. I thank you for listening. I thank you, Chris, for joining me. Chris? I know what you're going to do after this. You're going to leave a five-star review on iTunes, aren't you? Absolutely. Or Apple Podcasts. Everyone should do the same thing. And until then, don't look now. Keep us asleep. Keep us selfish. Keep us sedated. Goodbye.